the recording button. Wonderful, Dan, and then I will take over. Great. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to the lecture. Petrus will begin by explaining the background and the context. Thank you so much, Liz, uh, for doing this. Over to you, Petrus. Wonderful. Thank you, Dan. Um, so I'm going to um, just start by just, as Dan said, well, firstly, welcoming you all. Thank you for joining us for this lecture, which is called the 2022 Lauren Leclesio Lecture in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Cape Town. Um, and here you can see some beautiful pictures of Lauren Ecclesio. Um, and for those of you who don't know um, or didn't know Lauren, she was a developmental neuropsychologist who was a master's student here at the University of Cape Town and a PhD student here for some years. And she was an author of eight papers on tuberous sclerosis, complex TSC, a rare disease um, that has many neuropsychiatric and other manifestations. And Lauren was a very powerful champion for the importance of working in collaboration with individuals, families, and communities. And she really, even though she was a very young researcher, it was very clear that research can be a tool for empowerment of local communities, as long as we do it in the right sort of way. And she very sadly developed um, cancer and passed away at the beginning of 2018. And the Social Responsiveness Committee in the Department of Psychiatry decided that we wanted to start an annual lecture as part of our social responsiveness activities. And we therefore decided to invite an annual lecture by a clinician or an applied scientist who really exemplifies the spirit of community-based and participatory research. And so um, over the last number of years in 2018, I delivered the first um, lecture. 2019, we had Professor Marete de Jonge from Leiden. Um, then we had Professor Lebo Molezzane from the University of KwaZulu Natal in 2020. Last year, um, Professor Lionel Green Thompson, our Dean in the Faculty of Health Sciences delivered um, the lecture. And this year, um, we have Professor Liz Pelicano from University College London um, to deliver the lecture. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing and introduce you to Liz. So Liz, thank you firstly for joining us today. Professor Pelicano um, comes from Perth in Western Australia, where she um, grew up and did her PhD. Um, and she then moved to the UK. I think she worked at Oxford University in experimental psychology, um, also spent some time in Bristol as working in experimental psychology and um, worked in London at the University at, at UCL, University College London um, for some time. She then went back to Australia as a professor at Macquarie University in Sydney, um, where she continued her, her research and very recently moved back to London and is back at University College London. And Liz has been one of the first people in the autism research community who really started to say, how do we make sure that we're doing the right kind of research? And maybe we need to work much more closely and in participation with autistic people in order to make sure that our agendas are right and aligned and that we truly do socially responsive research. So Liz, I hope you will, you will understand why we wanted to ask you to do this year's Lauren Lichesio lecture. And I think without any further ado, I'd like to invite you to share your screen and um, to do your presentation, particularly focusing on, as you call it, autistic flourishing um, in mainly, I presume you will talk about adults. Um, autistic adults. So Liz, with that, welcome and over to you. Thank you so much, Petrus, and for everyone else um, for being um, at the seminar. Um, it's it's wonderful to be here, especially to give the um, 2022 Lauren Leclesio lecture. I didn't have the pl uh, pleasure of knowing Lauren, um, but on all accounts, from Petrus in particular, it sounds like she was a fierce advocate and very committed psychologist working in a very collaborative and participatory way with families and those with rare conditions. Um, Petrus also told me that she was um, a fashionista 
And so I think we would have gotten on really well on, for that reason alone. Um, but, um, you know, also for the shared commitment to participatory approaches. Um, and so in the spirit of those approaches and um, to honour Lauren's legacy, my talk today um, is all about getting us to think anew about the research that we do um, so that hopefully it makes a real difference to the people that we ultimately serve as researchers. In my case, that's autistic children, young people and adults and their allies. And that shared commitment um, reminds me of scenes like the one that you can see on your screen. Um, which is a photograph of my great friend and autistic colleague, Wen Lawson, talking ideas in my dining room, uh, along with a host of other researchers and my daughter, um, plotting a better way forward for autistic people all across the world. And it is that hope for a better way forward that I will talk about today. So my ambition in this talk is to generate you know, a, a broader discussion about what the foundations of a good life for autistic people might be and how research, autism research, can help or sometimes hinder us all to secure those foundations. So I'm going to try and do all of that today in three relatively straightforward um, sections. So first, I'm going to ask us to take stock of the extremely difficult two years or so that we've um, just lived through. As with all crises of this sort, you know, it's revealed both resilience and vulnerabilities. And I think at this point, it really it can pr prompt reflection. Then second, I'll move from the current moment and its lessons to the longer term goal. So once we know, you know, we know where we're starting, that is, we can begin to think what is possible on the road ahead. Working to identify the fundamental aspects of a good theory of autistic life, or what I'm calling a theory of autistic flourishing, following a series of eminent um, predecessors of whom I'll talk about a little. Then third, and finally, I'll set out what a theory of flourishing might mean for us in our practice as researchers. So there are the three straightforward parts, even if it's not exactly a small amount, I'm trying to bite off in this talk. So let me start with the extraordinarily difficult years we've just lived through. So COVID-19, as you all know, has taken a horrific toll on the lives, health and well-being of millions of people all across the world, and it still is. And the measures needed to constrain it and to mitigate its worst effects have had their huge price too. So in many places all over the world, people were required to stay at home unless engaging in essential activities. So schools moved online or stopped altogether. Restaurants, bars, theatres, museums, they all closed. People were told to work from home. Socialising with families and friends was halted. And it's so often the case, you know, autistic people have been, you know, on the front line, often carrying the heaviest burden, while not getting the attention that they have deserved from policymakers and public health officials all over the world. And this differential impact of the pandemic on autistic people was identified by both researchers and campaigners, you know, almost as soon as the pandemic hit. In this slide, you can see Tom Shakespeare and colleagues' vital effort to describe the differential impact of the pandemic, not just on autistic people, but on all disabled people in their path-breaking Lancet paper in 2020. So they say, people with disabilities have been differentially affected by COVID-19 because of three factors. The increased risk of poor outcomes from the disease itself, reduced access to routine healthcare, and the adverse social impacts of efforts to mitigate the pandemic. So risk of death from COVID-19 between January 24th and November 30th, 2020 in England was 3.1 times greater for disabled men and 3.5 times greater for disabled women than for men and women, women without disabilities. So Shakespeare and colleagues called this the triple jeopardy of facing people with disabilities. Those who were living in resident institutionalised residential settings, for example, you know, witnessed levels of infection far in excess than those living in more conventional households. Those who were dependent on key healthcare or other support services were also particularly at risk 
because those services either shut down or became far more difficult to access. And those who were already living with you know, mental health challenges like depression and anxiety were, were prone to respond far worse than others to government um, mandated restrictions like the stay at home orders, which followed in most um, uh, countries as the virus ripped through communities. Since Shakespeare's paper, a host of other large scale studies have confirmed his central hypothesis. Those who were more vulnerable prior to the pandemic have tended to fare far worse than the overall population during it. And sadly, we know in the vast majority of countries across the world, if not in all, that would have included a significant number of autistic people facing challenges to their health, to their social services, and their economic well-being, far in excess of many others. Many of the studies that have demonstrated this harsh reality have worked at a kind of aggregate or kind of quantitative level. And crucial as that overall picture of the pandemic's impact has been, we also need a more fine-grained understanding of what has happened for autistic people during COVID. And that was the ambition um, that led me together with seven autistic and non-autistic collaborators from the UK and Australia to organise an in-depth qualitative study on autistic people's experiences of the initial phase of the pandemic. The autistic community's you know, desire to participate in this work was, was huge. I've never received a response you know, to an invitation to share views and perspectives. Um, within weeks of setting up our group, we'd spoken in depth to 144 people, often talking for more than an hour each. That's you know, more than 7,000 minutes of recordings that we then had to analyse. Um, and sharing stories of a level of intensity and honesty that I haven't come across before. And what we discovered was extremely compelling. Contrary to some of our most pessimistic expectations, a number of the autistic people we spoke to reported some positive experiences during the earliest months of the pandemic um, in kind of May and April, May, June, um, 2020. In particular, they felt that the stay at home orders, what we called lockdown in Australia, freed them from some of the more overwhelming demands and expectations of living in a neurotypical world, you know, a world that isn't typically set up for them. Suddenly, some of the most pressing requirements usually placed on them, like having to fill in endless paperwork to secure their insurance or their welfare benefits, you know, they were lifted as was the need to negotiate, you know, physically getting kids to school, heading off to work, doing the shopping, keeping the household running while juggling many competing other commitments. Nonetheless, the overwhelming message was that this momentary sense of relief did not last. In fact, within weeks, it was crowded um, out by a sense of often severe difficulty. And this difficulty, though, did not emanate from the first two of Shakespeare's um, you know, anxieties about the virus itself um, and access to services and healthcare. Instead, it came from the third, the social implications of the pandemic experience. So far from welcoming the isolation that came from lockdown, as some commentators had suggested that they would, you know, the vast majority of autistic people we spoke to reported deeply missing the social contact that used to be a key aspect of their world. So our autistic participants, which included young people and adults, intensely missed seeing their friends. You know, Zoom, FaceTime was an insufficient substitute for the physical embodied interactions with other people that make up most of day-to-day -day life. And they also said, often to their own surprise, that they missed the more incidental social contact in neighbourhoods, in workplaces, in community settings that they had once taken for granted or had not even noticed and that was now taken away. So not having much or in some cases any social contact during the COVID-19 lockdown period, at least that initial lockdown, made them long for it. And so as one autistic adult describes in this quote, she said, 
I didn't realize how important that incidental human contact was to me. It was so incidental that it never really registered on my radar until it was gone. The paying for the petrol at the service station, as much as it shits me, because I work with an assistance dog, right? So everywhere I go, I've got this giant white majestic beast next to me. So the soundtrack of my life is, oh my God, it's a dog. It's a beautiful dog. What kind is he? How old is he? What does he do? And like, that drives me bananas most of the time. And I've actually found myself even missing that. Not being able to have those physical connections with others also seem to have a huge impact on people's mental health. So one autistic adult that I spoke to, you know, just said, I can't deal with being isolated like this. I just want to hug someone. Other people appreciated, you know, how much they needed that connection with others. As this autistic parent describes, and they said, you know, I've always looked at those sort of islands you see for sale going, I could totally be a hermit and just live somewhere in the middle of nowhere and never see another person. Happy days. Because people are really exhausting. But this has taught me that actually I do need people. I think the first probably six weeks, I didn't have enough contact with people and that made my mental health worse. So the missing of deep social connection and particularly incidental social contact flies in the face of so many common stereotypes about what autistic people want and what they don't want. How many times have we heard it said that, you know, autistic people don't want friends or they prefer a you know, life of self-isolation? We even have prominent theoretical accounts of autism that contend that autistic people have diminished social motivation. Our study clearly showed that that was not the case. The imposed isolation and the resulting reduced pressure on having to interact with others revealed just how important social connection is. Now that in itself, I think it tells us something extremely important and something which has implications far beyond the specifics of the case. The experience of the pandemic, and most importantly, the experience of what we felt we lost during the pandemic, has helped all of us to see what really matters in life. And one scholar who has made that clearer than almost any other is the Harvard political science professor, Daniel Allen. From the very earliest moments of the pandemic, Professor Allen brought together a broad multidisciplinary team to identify the best public policy responses to the pandemic. And that, you know, those responses have been formed to practice right across the world. But as you can see here, you know, she contends most importantly that it has also told us something more profound. The pandemic reminded us that human flourishing should be our fundamental goal as a society, and that such flourishing extends beyond basic material and physical security. As she puts it, the impact of the pandemic is a reminder that life requires us to do more than just survive and get by. It absolutely needs those things, of course, and nothing I am saying should be taken as suggesting otherwise, but they are not by themselves enough and they should not be the sole subjects of our efforts. Instead, as Professor Allen says, the fundamental goal we now need to commit ourselves to is enabling people to, to thrive or to flourish. What we want for people is not just to get on, that is, but to have identifiably good lives, to be able to do the things that they want to be able to do, especially those that help them to do everything else. So we should take this pandemic moment to spur us to think again about the foundations of human flourishing. And in our case, or in my case particularly, autistic people's flourishing. And so all of that takes me to my next set of questions. If the pandemic provides a moment to kind of step back and reflect on what we all really want and need from life, what are the key dimensions of autistic flourishing? And how can we hope to identify them?
And there's been a huge debate about the key elements of, of human flourishing since the very you know, beginnings. Most accounts start with Aristotle, um, and it remains a, a crucial element of modern day philosophy too. So Martha Nussbaum's capabilities approach draws heavily on this idea, and the political philosopher Deva Woodley has also made a major contribution. And the idea has also animated the more specifically autism literature for years now. So Jim Sinclair's work, which celebrates work, autism both as a way of being and a disability to accept and support, has enabled many of us to appreciate the elements of a good autistic life that many previously have overlooked. And the advocates of neurodiversity have helped us to look at the question anew too. Personally, I owe just as much to the in-depth conversations I've had with my wonderful autistic collaborators, colleagues, and friends over the years, even before the pandemic, on precisely this question. So 12 years ago, I organized the first um, conference on, on the ethical foundations of autism research at University College London. And, and during that conference, we brought together scientists of all kinds with autistic activists, philosophers, um, clinicians, family members, and the broader public. And the talks were you know, hugely thought provoking, honest and engaging. And the discussions were lively and even sometimes quite raw. I don't think I've been you know, in an academic space with so much energy as that day. And one of the most powerful talks was by Wen Lawson, who you saw on my first slide, and you can also see here. He talked about the notion of interdependence. So Wen said that day, you know, throughout the generations, society has consisted of people needing one another. It's not shameful to need others in one's life. Some need support and assistance more than others. Supporting autistic people and their families is just as needed as support for neurotypical um, people and their families. It might just be different in its extent and in its delivery. That notion that we're all dependent on each other, that is we're interdependent, should not have been a revelation to me at the time, but it definitely was. Especially because it contrasted so sharply with the kind of negativity that can come from those people who say that autistic people can't achieve the independence for which others aspire. If we acknowledge that we are all dependent on each other at different times in our lives, and that that can, in fact, be a good and vital part of life, then everything begins to look different. Just as it does that when we recognise that autistic people live through the pandemic restrictions, longing for greater social connection, not celebrating their isolation. It reminds us that the version of autistic flourishing that we often find in the autism research literature, whether explicit or implicit, just leaves a great deal to be desired. So drawing on all those conversations and more formal philosophical speculations together, I want to suggest today that, that there are at least five ways in which we, as a research community, need to reconsider autistic flourishing. So five elements or, or building blocks of autistic flourishing that, we, that haven't been given the attention that they deserve. And the first among these is the need to move from a perspective that says that the core to autistic flourishing is simply health to one that it is the far broader notion of well-being. As autism researchers, many of us have inherited a medical model that says, you know, health is what matters. And as such, our research remains often firmly embedded within the conventional medical paradigm. You know, prioritising a putatively objective standard of bodily and mental health over an apparently worryingly subjective um, understanding of well-being. Our research also continues to draw extensively from the developmental psychopathology literature, stressing the importance of you know, patterns of maladaptation in shaping the life course of autistic people. And as a result, you know, individual autistic people, so ch autistic children and, and adults, behavioural, cognitive, neural functionings are frequently compared to some typical or, or normal level of ability that is held as the ideal state of health. 
And following from this, you know, there's interventions and treatments still typically aim to remediate these apparent shortcomings, bringing them into line with the accepted norm. This narrow focus on health results in a radically constrained understanding of the experiences that can shape autistic lives or enable those lives to go well. It has the tendency to see elements of the autistic experience that stand outside the norm as deficits or as deviations. Indeed, so much so that even when autistic people outperform non-autistic people in scientific experiments, our tendency as researchers, including me, is to interpret those achievements as somehow revealing a problem. That is, data that in fact reveals strengths in autistic people are paradoxically and bizarrely interpreted in a negative way as a consequence of a deficit or an impairment. As the autistic scientists Michelle Dawson and colleague Laurent Matron so clearly describe, they say autistics, like non-autistics, have genuine difficulties in many areas and like non-autistics, require assistance in areas where their performance is weak. But autistics uniquely are seen as pathological when displaying significant or dramatic strengths, creating for autistics a nearly insurmountable disadvantage or disability not faced by non-autistics. So in this way, the medical paradigm colours our own perspectives of autistic people's capacities in many areas. It also limits the range of supports and services that can be actively considered, focusing predominantly on efforts to enable autistic people to conform to non-autistic expectations. So if we want to work towards a theory of autistic flourishing, my contention here is that we need to shift from a, a medical paradigm that prioritizes health to a paradigm that prioritizes a much broader sense of well-being. But just focusing on you know, well-being isn't by itself enough. It has to be well-being that is primarily determined and defined by autistic people themselves. So the second essential move is from an other defined framework to a self-defined one. At the moment, even when researchers and policymakers use the language of well-being and quality of life, these are often derived from a set of standard life achievements on which autistic people typically fare badly. For example, autistic people are shown to be far less likely than non-autistic people to go on to post-secondary education, to hold down a job, to live independently, or to have friends and intimate relationships. And it's concluded as such that autistic people have a poor quality of life. I'm not suggesting that these normative you know, life achievements are not important, but they do not by themselves provide an account of autistic well-being. And that's because we've far too rarely examined whether these life achievements are considered meaningful from the perspectives of autistic people themselves. And when that does happen, the outlook often changes. So in the last decade, there's been a, a series of studies that have begun to compare kind of standard researcher defined measures with more subjective autistic person led me measures. <clears throat> And what those studies have demonstrated is that these outcomes on these measures do not always match up. For example, an autistic person who might be highly dependent on others for their care, a so-called poor outcome, according to the standard framework, might nevertheless be happy and see themselves as enjoying a very good quality of life. Or another you know, autistic person who may no longer meet you know, diagnostic criteria for autism, a so-called good or optimal outcome, might in fact struggle to find their way in the world, always feeling different and distant from others. And it's not just that we get misleading results if we don't attend to subjective perspectives. We also fail to grant autistic people the dignity, the agency and the respect that they deserve. Nobody has high quality of life if their life goals are primarily set or evaluated by others. 
One other way of putting this is, is if we want to take well-being seriously, we need to take autistic autonomy seriously too. And here I refer again to Daniel Allen, who says in her latest book, you know, human beings are creatures that need to chart their own courses in life. They thrive on autonomy, the opportunity for self-creation and self-governance. And that is true even of, of people who are largely dependent on others to help to meet their needs. So if we really want to come to a theory of autistic flourishing, we need to understand what a good life means to autistic people themselves. So this focus on autistic autonomy and self-evaluation then takes me to my third element or building block of a theory of autistic flourishing. What I've called the move from the big to the small. Once we ask autistic people what actually matters to them when they consider their good life, they very quickly tell us that it is not the generally grand moonshots of academic research or public policy making, but a, far, a range of far more everyday concerns that build up to be the, you know, the weft of ordinary life. This all became very apparent to me um, more than 10 years ago when Tony Charman and I um, decided to examine the state of autism research in the UK. And in that study, we looked at you know, how much had been spent on autism research and particularly what it had been spent on. And we asked almost 2,000 autistic people and their family members, practitioners and researchers to understand what they thought of it and where they thought the funds towards autism research should be prioritised in the future. While autistic people and their family members were very impressed by the quality of British autism research, they were not at all convinced that it had anything to do with autistic flourishing. You know, one woman said to me, you know, I fill in all these questionnaires and I do everything I can to help. But when it comes down to it, it's not real life. Too many people felt that there was a huge gap between the more grand abstract knowledge that was often produced by research and their real life everyday concerns. You know, the vast majority of British autism research at that point simply wasn't asking, you know, how can an autistic per young person learn to catch the bus by themselves or to keep themselves safe? It wasn't helping them get the shopping done or to have, you know, how to make friends and maintain relationships. Our participants wanted to see real changes for themselves, their child, or for the person with whom they worked. Autistic people thought British academics were not taking enough notice of real life issues. And they were right. Um, and this was also driven home by the participants in our COVID-19 study. Um, so they deeply felt the loss of their everyday routines and expected experiences. And they also felt that nobody had noticed how important that was. Because of the lockdown, participants were un unable to engage in the kinds of everyday activities that many had strived hard to access in the past and which were essential for their well-being. So like going to the library, the local swimming pool, the cinema, the mall, you know, weekly sports training or dance class, the playground with the kids. One adult said, you know, pretty much everything in my life that I love doing was taken and was just gone. Another adult, this time an autistic parent, put it, you know, even the meaningless stuff had become meaningful and needed. As a research community, we've been too neglectful of the mundane aspects of life that matter to people. So if we want to work towards an account of autistic flourishing, then we need to move from the big to the small. In part, this is because we've neglected the broader context which creates the range of real opportunities for autistic people, including the policy context. And that takes me to my fourth element, the need to move from an individual understanding of flourishing to a contextual one. So pervasive adoption of the medical model in conventional autism research has also meant that there is an overemphasis on specific attributes of individuals as opposed to the broader context in which autistic people live. So in the conventional medical view, autism and its associated disabilities are seen as something inherent to the individual. 
biomedical research tends not to explain an autistic person's difficulties with reference to the context in which the difficulty occurs, home, school, work, the community, but rather as a characteristic of the individual themselves. And taking this individualistic starting point suggests that the fault for difficulties in life resides with the individual themselves. And thus the burden of correcting these perceived difficulties lies there too. So treatments and interventions situated within a medical model of disability have thus been designed to modify, diminish or enhance autistic children and adults' behaviours to address these key goals. And let me just illustrate this phenomenon with a, an example on the treatment of stimming behaviour, rhythmic repetitive behaviours. Seen through the lens of the conventional medical model, there's been a tendency to perceive so-called repetitive motor stereotypies, such as hand flapping, as an individual problem with no clear purpose or function, and which prevent the child, or indeed adult, from learning adaptive or other skills. In fact, it now seems likely that they often soon often serve a very regulatory soothing function for autistic people. A study inspired by the work of um, Robin Stewart and led by autistic researcher, Dr. Stephen Capp, that I was involved in, you know, showed that many participants reported their stims to be calming and helped to soothe what could be sometimes be, you know, really intense feelings, helping them to regain a sense of control. As you can see, this autistic adult describes, you know, he said, it sort of metronomes everything in your body to sort of go at that speed. So it just sort of helps quell everything. So it's the broader context which creates the problematic response, not the behavior itself. Non-autistic people's reaction to stimming is the issue, not the stimming per se. Attention would be better directed towards social interventions that aim to shift the negative perceptions of stimming. So it is a contextual response to the individual here that I think we need to address. And all of this has powerful lessons that we, we you know, of what we need to think about. Um, so for if the possibilities of, um, of flourishing depend not just upon the individual, but instead what the political philosopher Diva Woodley calls the individual in context, then we need to move our attention away from its sole focus on the individual and their strengths and weaknesses and appreciate instead what it is that makes anything possible or impossible for them. That means accepting that the world needs to change as well as the individual. As Woodley says, taking into account the reality of context necessitates that we wrestle with the systematic power asymmetries that structure the world we share, which then requires us to account and seek to mitigate the effects of oppression and domination. So four elements of, um, of, of a theory of autistic flourishing so far, moving from health to well-being, from other defined to self-defined, from the big to the small, from the individual to the contextual. And some of you will be you know, thinking that much of this should be you know, self-evident. So my fifth element of a theory of autistic flourishing asks why so many of us in the autism research community have missed these four for so long. And in part, I believe it's because of a long history of theory of mind research, which suggested that autistic people have an impaired ability to reflect on their own mental states. And this has led to the questioning of the veracity of autistic people's accounts of their own experiences. They're often seen as unreliable. And as a result, researchers have often avoided attending to first person testimony, preferring to privilege reports, you know, from parents, teachers, or other informants, or laboratory, a lab based you know, observation um, methods, over considering the perspectives of the person themselves. Indeed, as Donna Williams um, described, right from the start, from the time someone came up with the word autism, the condition has been judged from the outside by its appearances and not from the inside according to how it is experienced. As well as shaping research findings, this lack of attention to autistic people's perspectives 
has the consequence of ensuring that autistic people themselves have almost no say as to what gets researched in autism science, why or how. And ever since the idea of autism was first developed in the 1940s, you know, autism science has typically been designed and conducted without any significant input from autistic people and their families. And I think that's contrib contributed towards research agendas and research methods that rarely relate to the challenges that autistic people face. And when I say input, I mean, you know, beyond input, you know, as passive participants or subjects in research, because they, they certainly do that, but input into the decision making processes around research. So in the design, in the implementation of the research, in the analysis and in interpretation of the findings, that is being partners or collaborators in the research. Um, and as we know from my own work, you know, that lack of involvement results in real feelings of frustration. Indeed, in a focus group that I ran um, for a study, you know, one autistic adult looked at me rather skeptically and said, whatever I say, is it really going to influence anyone? Encouragingly, in the last decade, this has begun to change. There is a slow but growing movement towards collaborating with autistic people and their allies as part of the research process. So where, you know, where they, they are partners in deciding what kind of research is done, how it's done, and, and how results, research results are interpreted and how the findings are used. And these so-called participatory processes draw on the practical wisdom of non-scientists non and have been shown outside the field of autism to have a dramatic effect on both the research agenda and on the effectiveness of the research. So the fundamental idea here is that we will learn more, we will understand more, we will know more once we've put lived experience and research experience together. So putting all of this into one, <laughs> My theory of autistic flourishing. It recognizes that subjective well-being matters as well as bodily and mental health. It stresses that autistic people should have the same interest in choosing their own lives as anyone else. It accepts that the everyday aspects of life matter to people, not just those that seem big, you know, from the outside. Understanding that the context in which people live always shapes opportunities and is therefore an appropriate subject for research. And it contends that we will only notice any of this if we work side by side with autistic people and their allies when designing and conducting our research. So they're the five things. I want now in the, in the final section of um, today's talk to say a little bit more, co more concretely about how I think our research might change if we accept this broader approach. In other, in other words, you know, what would our practice look like if we give well-being prominence, if we amplify autistic autonomy, if we attend to the everyday, if we acknowledge context, and if we co-design and co-produce? So for my third and final section, as I move towards the conclusion, I just want to highlight two studies that might start to give us an answer. And the first comes from um, the field of executive function. I probably don't need to define executive function for this group, but um, for those of you who don't know, it's an umbrella term that includes, you know, those skills largely mediated by the prefrontal cortex, which are necessary for goal-directed behaviours. And, and they're critical for doing, you know, everyday things, you know, you're switching between tasks while trying to meet a deadline or, you know, trying <laughs> desperately to resist that big bar of chocolate in the cupboard. Researchers have long held that autistic people have, you know, executive problems and that this, at least superficially, you know, seems to map on reported problems in everyday life. Yet, despite decades of research on executive function in autism and hundreds of published papers, the existing scientific literature remains contradictory and confusing um, and finds, you know, group differences of only moderate effect. And such effects are a far cry from the often large effect sizes reported on questionnaire measures of real world executive functioning and the everyday planning and flexibility difficulties that are reported by autistic people and their parents in our own work. 
So why is there such a disparity between how autistic people and their families report their lives and the view of the established science? I think it goes back to many of the themes that I've raised so far. For example, a tendency to, to look for the grand, grand kind of abstract expectations, explanations, sorry, than to look um, at the everyday detail. And a tendency to think of it as an individual failing rather than a contextual response. All underpinned by an unwillingness to take seriously the perspectives of autistic people themselves. Experimental investigations of executive function in, in autism have relied heavily on structured behavioral paradigms designed for the computer or the tabletop to try and target, you know, these specific components of executive skills, just like the one that you can see on your screen, the so-called Tower of London task. People are giving a pegboard with red, white and black beads all set out in a particular configuration, the start state, and they're asked to move those beads from the start state to this new configuration, the end state, in the minimum number of moves. And better performance on this task reflects better planning ability. But such tasks, however, lack representativeness, that correspondence between the task and real life settings. And they also lack generalizability, the degree to which performance on the task predicts problems in real life settings. In my own work, we've consistently shown that a significant proportion of autistic people, so children and young people, can pass these tasks with ease. Yet they and their parents often report really struggling with many apparently related tasks in everyday life, like shopping in the local grocery store or finding one's way around a new town. So the conventional way of measuring executive skills in the lab simply aren't measuring what autistic people want to measure in real life. So what are the you know, real life phenomenological experiences of autistic people's executive control? And how are they limiting their ability to thrive? What would, you, what would you we be doing you know, if we wanted to help autistic people flourish? We don't know much about any of this. Um, I think in part because we've you know, so rarely bothered to ask. So in a qualitative study that Laura and Kenny and Remington and I did with autistic young people and their parents, we found that the real life executive issues they reported were highly variable and depended critically on the context in which they were doing the task. For example, like cooking at home versus cooking at school. They varied um, according to their mental state. So, you know, their level of, of, level of anxiety as they did some task. They varied according to the clarity of the task instructions. And just as this quote describes, they also varied according to their motivational interest in doing the task. So this autistic young person said, so if it's something which I really don't like, I find that I'm often a lot slower than if it's something which I really do like. And yeah, sometimes my mum has said stuff like, once you finish your college assignment, you can play your clarinet. And I'm just like, well, seeing as I really don't enjoy clarinet playing, I don't think I'll ever get this assignment done. So our current you know, lab-based um, researcher designed measure, measures of executive function don't allow us to capture this context dependent nature of everyday executive skills or the important role of non-executive factors that might influence the deployment of executive control. And I don't think it needs to be like this. Attending to autistic people's own perspectives provides one very straightforward way of changing our focus. Um, for example, one yeah, um, autistic young person described how he has a one track mind. And he went on to say, you know, that's nothing to be particularly ashamed about. It's just the way I work. I just think it's because my mind, like subconsciously or consciously, just prioritizes one piece of information over the other. And for that reason, I'm not able to remember everything. His insights align with an autistic driven concept known as monotropism a tendency to focus attention on one thing at a time, which attracts most or all of a person's processing resources. Remarkably, this concept of monotropism was put forth back in 2005 by Dinah Murray, um, Mike Letzer and Wen Wilson, but has thus far received scant empirical attention in the literature. Our participants also talked about difficulties starting 
stopping or kind of changing direction. And these reports mapped onto, map onto the notion of autistic inertia, a concept, again, that comes up repeatedly in early and current autistic writings and blog posts, um, but um, has, isn't you know, seen in the literature at all. On the face of it, inertia seems to be driven by executive related difficulties. So you know, difficulties with shifting or transitioning and motor planning. But the precise, you know, componential nature of such real life difficulties have not been examined by researchers. So what, we should, what, so what should we do instead? We should take autistic flourishing seriously in the five ways that I've sketched out. And in practice, that means doing a study that is co-produced with autistic community members to try to come up with a working definition of, for example, what autistic inertia is, so that we can investigate both its underlying mechanisms and how it operates in context. Our very early stages of analysis, I'm doing this with a, um, um, a team of autistic and non-autistic researchers, have demonstrated how disabling inertia can be in a person's life. So as one autistic adult described to us, you know, it's the single most disabling part of being autistic for me. It's a daily struggle. Those same very obviously preliminary um, findings have, have also revealed the potential plus sides of that inertia, which what some people call flow, a concept derived from, you know, the, from the broader psychological literature, which refers to being you know, really immersed in a particular thing which depending on what that thing is, you know, could, could bring real joy to a person's life. As this young autistic person said, you know, the flow feels really good while I'm in it. It's fantastic. I'm actually doing something. I'm actually making progress or I'm actually making a difference. I'm doing something that I like to do for once. Now, these very early findings illustrate the importance of developing a, a new approach that bridges that gap between lab and life through attending to the everyday, through acknowledging context, and through taking autistic, you know, taking seriously autistic derived concepts, ideas, and experiences. My second and final example of research which takes those five elements of autistic flourishing seriously comes from a wonderful project in which I worked with a team of autistic and non-autistic researchers to gather the untold histories of late diagnosed autistic people in mid to late adulthood. So we adopted here a participatory approach. So that collaborative um, working um, with autistic partners and ac non-autistic academics, including an autistic advisory group um, who actively participated in all decision-making processes. In other words, it was a really deep and sustained effort at genuine co-production in research. We also adopted an oral history approach, which records recollections of people and groups to preserve their voices and stories and to situate them within a particular time and place in history. It is attendant to those realities of oppression and domination of which we just saw Diva Woodley speak. So we invited autistic, late diagnosed autistic adults to share their life histories with us so that we might better understand the consequences of living without a diagnosis, to kind of think about what precipitates an autism diagnosis in mid to late adulthood, and to identify the perceived impact of receiving that diagnosis. And what did we find out? Well, these adults spoke about their sense of self and how that had changed over time. They told us about you know, the many negative experiences, including trauma, which had shaped how they think about themselves. For most, though not all, you know, autism design, diagnosis had a, had a very positive impact on their sense of self, allowing them to understand more about their own past and to feel good about their autistic identity, reinforcing their well-being, contributing to autistic flourishing. So one of our participants, Tanya, described recognising herself as autistic as a light bulb moment. For another participant, Malcolm, you know, the light came on with diagnosis, allowing him to reconstruct my perspective of who I am and who I want to be. Veronica, as you can see on the slide, you know, described how her transformation and sense of self was linked to autism diagnosis. She said, and what was my life before diagnosis? It was bits and pieces of disconnected things, 
I was a failure, right? And there was no center, but there was a center, me. The center is I'm autistic. And that explained all of that. Previously, some researchers have said that autistic people have a limited or impaired sense of self. Instead, our results show that, you know, some autistic people reflect very deeply on their lives and their changing self, a sense of self-identity over time. There were so many lessons that we could derive from the Hidden Histories Project, you know, mapping onto each of the proposed um, elements of flourishing, the crucial role of attending to subjective well-being, the vital place of that sense of identity and autonomy in giving meaning to people's lives, the realisation that the crucial moments of life aren't defined in advance, but emerge often in the most mundane and apparently everyday of settings. The need to attend to the public policy choices that make diagnose, diagnosis possible and support people who are going through that process. And perhaps most of all, um, our study revealed that the importance of autistic people, um, for autistic people, of working with autistic researchers in genuine co production. So our participatory efforts. Um, ensure that the research process was really thorough, respectful, and supportive of our autistic participants, you know, who often described very harrowing lives. And they were all interviewed by an autistic researcher, an autistic interviewer, and, that, and being able to talk to an autistic interviewer brought extraordinary rewards. So our participants told us that their open and authentic interactions with our autistic researchers meant that they were more forthcoming than they might have been with a non-autistic researcher, or at least a researcher who was not on their wavelength. That is to say, their sense of empowerment shared by those autistic people who were given the opportunity to reflect on their own lives directly with an autistic researcher provided access to insights that they may not have shared otherwise. So focusing on flourishing gave us better research. Um, I wish I could talk about all of these things in lots more detail, but I'm running out of time. Um, but what I want to do just um, in, my, in, what I, in my closing is to tie what I've said together. So as I said right at the start of the talk, it's a huge honour to spend you know, my life working as an autism researcher. I have wonderful colleagues and collaborators and friends with whom it is an absolute joy to work. And I get to meet the most fantastic people, as you can see in my closing slide here, whose lives can be full of the most immense challenges, but who inspire us every day with their creativity, their kindness and commitment, and who deserve to be able to live their very best lives. What I've aimed to show today is how that realization, obvious though it is on the surface, can also encourage us to think again about the priorities that we set ourselves, changing the focus of our work and the way that we have done it. My personal commitment coming out of the pandemic and all that has gone before it is to make the possibilities of autistic flourishing more explicitly the centerpiece of my work. I've said today just a little bit of how I'm gonna do that, <laughs> you know, by giving wellbeing prominence, by amplifying autistic autonomy, by attending to the everyday, by acknowledging context, and by co-designing and co-producing with autistic people and their allies. And I look forward very much to hearing about how you will do it too. Thank you very much. Dear Liz, thank you for a wonderfully presented and very, very inspiring talk. Um, I'm sure you've given everyone who's been on the call all sorts of food for thought. Um, so thank you for that. I'm going to ask Dan to stop the recording. And I know we don't have many minutes left, but I wanted to check just if there's somebody who has a burning question or a comment they want to make. We can see in the chat, I've invited people to, to add comments in the chat. So here um, is a lovely, um, you can see Liz, some of the lovely comments from Lindsay Koch. Um, saying you're speaking my language, I've been involved in lots of research projects, um, et cetera. 